uh, let's get a closer look at this at this tweet here. Although I now I have two laptops up here, so I have to do the right one. There we go. Uh, okay, so um, this is why merge mining and drive chains are such a nasty attack. Paul is a really awful person to push this. Um, <laughs> and then we have here we have even more intrigue. Um, merge mined side chains was. Greg Maxwell's biggest mistake. In fact, the biggest mistake of a lot of people. So there's just so much intrigue here. Uh, my name is Paul Stortz. Uh, I have a background in economics and statistics, particularly. For two and a half years, I worked at the Yale Economics Department for Bill Nordhaus directly. He won the Nobel Prize a few months ago. Uh, while I was working there, I invented this Bitcoin technology called Truthcoin, which is later split up into several projects. Augur and Gnosis are Ethereum versions. There's one called M of AO by Zach Hess. That's its own blockchain. And then there's a Bitcoin Core fork that is called Bitcoin Hivemind. I also started a cool Bitcoin blog called truthcoin.info and have a bunch of famous posts up here that a lot of people seem to uh, enjoy reading. This one about nothing is cheaper than proof of work cycles back every now and then and we'll get like seven, 10,000 views in a day when someone links to it. Um, and I presented at the first three scaling conferences and I was on the program committee for the, the fourth one. More succinctly, I'm a really awful person, uh, I suppose. So I, I, I was going to originally give this talk on something kind of really specific and esoteric, but uh, instead this like, thing happened like, uh, like last week, so I thought I'd kind of rearrange the talk and it will still be about what I wanted it to be about, but it will just be in kind of a different order than you were thinking. So first I'm going to talk about what sidechains are and how they work, and then I'm gonna talk right, go right into these critiques, because why should you have to you know, fight personally through all this uh, technical specialization when there's already people who will critique the project for you? And then I'm gonna to try to maybe at the end sneak in this point that I was going to make as the entire sidechain's presentation before. So, oh, two laptops at once, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna use the mouse like an idiot on this one. Okay, here we go. So, what are side chains? Surprisingly, the definition has become quite contentious. The definition that I use is a little old-fashioned. It's this original definition about um, basically saying that hard forks are bad because implementation changes to the consensus critical parts of Bitcoin must necessarily be handled very conservatively. But you can do something else instead where you can kind of build a little compartment that people can opt into. And this is a really good sentence here, I think. Uh, we propose a new technology, pegged side chains, which enables Bitcoins and other ledger assets to be transferred between multiple blockchains. This gives users access to new and innovative cryptocurrency systems using the assets they already own. So that's great. Um, these are some slides from Adam Back from 2016. He's talking about the things that you can use sidechains for a little bit more concretely. Um, basically, though, the idea is that Bitcoin will, you can send Bitcoin to a different piece of software and, and the Bitcoin money can kind of pretend that it's an altcoin. So it can pretend to be like Ethereum or Zcash or, or Bitcoin Cash. Um, this is a meme that I made on my website when big, the price of Bitcoin was $6,800. And now I have to scroll down. Um, it's a screenshot of coin market cap. And with sidechains, there's no real need for altcoins to exist because you can replicate their features perfectly. So the least popular altcoin will be on the, the chopping block. It will probably collapse and die out. And then the second least popular one will be the new least popular living one, and that one will die out, and then they'll probably just be all destroyed in something that I call iterative deletion. Um, and so instead, in the sidechain world, the different quantities of Bitcoin will be in, on different pieces of software, on different chains. And so you can see at the bottom here, I have this grand total 21 million coin limit, and um, I have uh, these 4.3 million coins that have not yet been mined, and we have the 16 or so, 17 million that are in circulation, and they would be broken up 
not all of them would be on Bitcoin Core. Some of them would be hanging out on other projects, and those projects are free to take risks or be very dumb ideas. Uh, so that's kind of the idea. And this is a, this is kind of a restatement of this multiple blockchains, uh, hard fork alternative concept. So I actually built this. Uh, actually, Cryptax basically did all the work, and he's also at this conference, although I don't know. I don't see him in the room, so I guess he's taking advantage. Oh, he's over there. So Cryptax and I, uh, we built this. And here's three screenshots. Um, you can see this one is Bitcoin Core with a different color scheme, but also with a tab that's called Sidechains in the top right. And then you, um, here, this is how you add a new sidechain. You first you write the software, and then you paste, excuse me, you paste the hash of the software here and click this button. These are a little outdated. We've actually made this a lot better, but this is a, we'll give you a basic idea. Um, so you just kind of click a, click a button and then this uh, sidechain, it's a little more complicated than that, but this is basically it. And uh, then you have this sidechain that exists in a list and you can send Bitcoin to this piece of software and it will receive it. And then you can also send uh, Bitcoin away from that piece of software and get it back from this, uh, this is called Grin, but that's a joke. This isn't actually Grin, it's just an example that we, we titled Grin, which is a Mimblewimble uh, project, of course, but that's like an idea, of this, this example of stealing the altcoin technology. Okay, so how does it work? There is a, uh, there's these two components to DriveChain, which is the sidechains technology that um, Cryptex and I developed. One is this idea of the hash rate escrow, just like a container output, and it compresses three to six months of sidechain data into a fixed 32 bytes, and I'm gonna explain that because it's pretty important. Um, but then there's this other thing called blind merge mining, which replaces the act of running a sidechain node with the act of just including a single high fee transaction. So what does all that mean? Well, here I have a diagram. In uh, the main chain is in orange, and the sidechain is in green below. And the thing is, the, the main chain full nodes do not and cannot validate the sidechain rules or data. So, because that would, uh, well, I'll get to that in a second, but the yeah, whole point here is that these are like optional plugins. So the main chain full node needs to be able to see perfectly accurate picture of the network, regardless of what happens on the sidechain. But as a, there's a problem with that, which is that uh, two, to have the, below, to the a main chain full node, these two histories will look the same. And I have one where A sends money to B, and then B sends money to themselves in the side chain. And then it changes owners to E and F. But then there's a different history where A sends money to B, sends money to C, sends money to D, and then sends money to a completely different person, H. Uh, and to the main chain, these have to look the same. You just see that A and B went in and E and F came out or that H came out. And you don't know which one of them is legitimate. Um, uh, this, but in, since you are only tracking this net effect, you can in fact compress it down to one transaction ID, which is just 32 bytes. And we basically just cheat and we say these 32 bytes will probably be correct, although there's more to it than that as I'm going to explain. And the thing is, you've compressed it down to 32 bytes, and the sidechain full nodes and the sidechain SPV nodes will be yelling these 32 bytes constantly every block for the 32 months. So they'll be trying to warn everyone which of the 32 bytes are right. But the only way to know for sure if they're right is to run the sidechain full node, and that is the illegal thing because that cannot be mandatory for our main chain users. And I have this metaphor, oops, sorry. I have this metaphor that people think is, is very funny, but it's basically like you're trying to cross this finish line. The 32 bytes are inserted into the main chain and then they march very slowly across a kind of finish line. And the finish line is very, very, very far away. It's 13,150 steps away and you can only take one step per block. So this is very, very rare. 32 bytes, three to six months. Um, and the thing is only one, 30, per side chain, only one 32 byte train car can advance at a time. So I have a funny video here. Uh, it's not really a video, but it's pretty simple and you can just see that only one of these things will be able to take a step forward at a time because if you try multiple ones at once, then it's a mutual exclusivity. So if one advances, the others go backwards. 
So you're gonna want to watch this uh, second from the bottom one. That one's gonna go. I'll do this in a second. This one will go up a little bit first. So I'll go back. And this time equals ten, and then one goes up, and then another one goes up, and the other ones are forced to go back to this finish line. Miners can also just abstain from moving any of these, or they can just say they don't know what's going on and set them all back. But only ultimately, you can only get one to move forward. And I'm going to explain my line merge mining in a second because it's best explained. All of this is best explained in the context of the critiques because, you know, again, what does it matter? What I think, how I think it works. Uh, let's hear from the, you know, the skeptics. So the, the two big critiques are this idea that miners can steal and also this extremely esoteric Peter Todd point about an increased likelihood of main chain uh, transaction censorship. So I'm going to... Uh, refute both of these, or try to. Um, both, both, both of them are completely false, and they're both so weird, and they have so many weird errors mixed in, and just general confusion, that I, I actually often trip myself up by trying to articulate all of them at once, which is why I wrote, wrote this down. And you'll see, it's like, there's like five things wrong simultaneously with, with both of them. So, uh, here we go. Now, the idea here is that, uh, of course, I just assume that these 32 bytes will be right, but there's nothing, absolutely no way of uh, demonstrating that. And so why would I do that? Why wouldn't the 32 bytes just be bytes that immediately reassign all of the Bitcoin to like Jihan Wu or something? And uh, the act of moving a train car forward, it only costs the opportunity of moving some other train car forward so that that's not, um, you know, people are not really convinced by this. And they say, well, miners will just take um, so just take the money. So now I'm going to respond to that, which is that first, this in five parts, and I'm going to read the the reason, and then I'm going to put up a little summary and thing. So, so first, it's admittedly true that all SPV proofs, whether or not they're drive chain or something else, they have to allow miners to forge a withdrawal of the funds, because SPV proofs are only gated by proof of work. But that's completely intentional because that's exactly what allows the sidechain to be optional in the first place. So if we wanted to, we could easily prevent minor theft 100%. We could just force all main chain full nodes to validate all the sidechain blocks. But that would be the so-called evil fork or the soft hard fork, and it would be a de facto unlimited block size increase for all users and an unlimited, theoretically unlimited loss of decentralization. So it's like intentionally we're avoiding this bleak outcome. The only we have to choose one of three options. One is mandatory side chains and evil forks, and unlimited loss of decentralization. And the, the second one is altcoins, whose mere existence violates the 21 million coin limit through a kind of inflation tax. And then the third one is this side chains whose withdrawals only rely on SPV proofs where you can, miners can steal sort of applies. And so the people who criticize uh, drive chain on this basis for its use of SPV security, they probably don't realize that they're necessarily instead supporting either unlimited loss of full node decentralization, and mandatory sidechains, or else they're supporting an unlimited inflation tax on Bitcoiners via, via altcoins. So that is the first. Would you prefer that it were mandatory, in which case it would be perfectly safe, or would you prefer these altcoins hang around and, and drain resources from and attention from Bitcoin? Now, the second thing is while all SPV proofs are, you know, vulnerable to minor tampering, um, DriveChain has extra features, as I just explained. So they, the thing is compressed super low, and you have these 32 bytes, and they're announced and then forced to march very slowly, one step per block, across a finish line that is very far away. So even with 100% hash rate participation in the attack, this takes three months. So new contestants begin the race at any time. Only one racer can step forward at a time. Um, and which whoever crossed the 32 byte uh, finish line first will win. But these sidechain SPV nodes are going to be yelling as, as loud as possible um, what the correct 32 bytes are. And so, if there's, um, if, so even if there's constant maximum scale professional tampering, it will all be very, very easy for the user to observe and demonstrate to others. And investors and users have plenty of time to react to this. And one reaction could be the UASF to block the, the tamper the 32 byte transaction from ever crossing the finish line when it finally gets there. And that's much easier than, for example, the SegWit UASF because it requires no software development, no real life coordination on actions and timing. And if the UASF fails, 
and, and if the sidechain was objectively valuable, then the Bitcoin's total transaction fees and exchange rate should fall, which would punish the very miners who instigated the tampering. So it's transparent and it harms the miners. There are all these other rules that are enforced by main chain nodes that make it much harder to steal from the sidechain. Third is up. Third is that some sidechains are bad and you actually want to get rid of them. So it's a good thing if miners have an incentive to evict these people. It's kind of like a city with a large criminal homeless population or something. Some of the sidechains, if they work correctly, they can leech off of other sidechains, which is something that I hope to explain, but probably won't have anywhere near enough time. But the point is you actually want to get rid of these people. And how can you make sure that only the best sidechains are let in and only the worst ones are kept out? You give the decision to the people who um, have who have this most skin in the game, who get the transaction fees or who suffer when the Bitcoin price declines. Fourth, the, the very idea of can and the whole miners can steal shtick is a complete misrepresentation of the way Bitcoin works. In a naive sense, bit miners can always steal Bitcoin, whether or not it's on drive chain or main chain or even in lightning channels. This is because miners just control the contents of the blockchain. And so the true question has always been, will miners steal anything? And in answering it, we always rely on these theories about miners' choices and motivations and behavior, and then we apply those theories to a given design. Um, so I think the, the purport of this can language is to imply falsely that drive chain design puts users' bitcoins in, into immediate risk of just being taken by the miners in the very next block, and therefore that I'm assuming some kind of minor altruism or something. But the truth is that there are f features in drive chain uh, especially the slow, transparent, high effort withdrawal process that I assume will convince the profit maximizing selfish miners to that harvesting the side chains for their transaction fees, their ongoing transaction fees and their value boosting properties are, is more lucrative than just devouring them in one shot. You know, it's like killing the goose that laid the golden egg. So use of the word can equals does not understand the way Bitcoin works. And fifth, most importantly, uh, it doesn't apply. You can only steal funds that the user has deposited to a sidechain. So it's uh, completely non-sidechain funds are completely unaffected by sidechains, obviously. And consumer sovereignty is a basic principle of Bitcoin. So users are allowed to handle their own funds however they like, and they're even allowed to destroy them or delete them. And uh, so you should really just let people make their own mistakes. Now, the second one is extremely bizarre. And now I see that I'm not, I mean, I'm gonna have a little bit of time to explain how weird it is. So I'll run through this very quickly. But basically, the argument, the, the, the argument says that drive chain increases the risk of transaction censorship on the main chain by giving economic advantages to large pools, which makes them inevitable in equilibrium. And it simultaneously makes these large pools less anonymous somehow and more susceptible to coercion, which eventually affects the main chain users. Now, of course, this is why I invented blind merge mining, which completely solves this problem. In regular merge mining, a miner needs to run a full node of everything they collect transaction fees on, but with blind merge mining, this thing that I invented, um, you do not need to do that. So the problem is just solved. Um, the full nodes don't need to run the sidechain software. Uh, and instead of exchanging 100% of the fixed network, 100% uh, of the data that would go across the sidechain full node, they just need a a tiny, tiny amount of um, tiny amount of data that mempool data that's fixed. Uh, and let me explain. Let's see, I have a good way of explaining how this works. Somewhere, um, yeah. Oh, but I think I just won't. So because uh, I don't have time. But the the even though this I solved this with blind merge mining, the complaint is actually complete nonsense. And I would like to explain why in a lot of detail, but I think I'd rather like have the time for questions. But one reason is that there is there's a ridiculous um, magnitude of the argument. So I see at the top, I'm saying this argument basically sell, says that if Bitmain tell, sells t-shirts on the side, then eventually all miners will need to sell t-shirts and then anyone who can control t-shirts will control Bitcoin. And then Peter Todd admits that that is in fact what he's saying, which is ridiculous. And the thing is, there's, I have a long uh, couple paragraphs here that I'm not gonna get to read, but the argument ends up contradicting itself because he's saying that every 10 cents of profit eventually becomes mandatory. But this is a, you know, an inducement of 10 cents is different from a, something that's really mandatory. But there's more to it than that, which is that the argument ends up contradicting itself because it says there'll be main chain transaction censorship and 
those tra main chain transactions pay transaction fees. So including every single main chain transaction, miner, mining pools are going to end up fighting for that just as hard as they would fight to you know, get any other source of profits, the t-shirts, for example. So, And again, yeah, I don't have a lot of uh, time for this, but there's a conflation between mining centralization and node centralization in the hopes that by using the word centralization, you'll be tricked into thinking they're the same thing, even though they're completely different. And in fact, miners are suppliers and, con and users are customers, so what's good for one will eventually be something that's bad for the other. So it's actually, so I would like to explain a lot of this more, but I don't have enough time. The other thing is transaction censorship is a privacy issue. So if you just solve privacy, then you don't have to worry about this at all. It's really, that's the main focus for anyone who's worried about transaction censorship should be focused on that. The other thing I do want to mention before I just sprint through right directly to the end is that we probably need the merge mining fees. Uh, I don't have time to explain what this is, but basically it's the security budget over 40 years of fees are zero. And I've compared it to the USA defense budget. And it's all in billions per year. And what I would have explained is that the block subsidy and the transaction fees are completely different things. And in fact, um, people have now learned to use altcoins as a medium of exchange, and the fees are low, which means that we currently get about $10 million per year in fees. We get like $200 a block. And without merge mining, we might, the, fee, the total amount of fees might plausibly never be higher than that. And so it just adds 0.01 cents when priced in billions to this, and then um, that's not enough. So far from being a threat to Bitcoin, it's possibly the only savior. And vanilla burnt mining can't be stopped, so I don't know exactly what Peter Todd's argument is because this is like inevitable. So, and not the blind merge mining part, the vanilla part is less difficult, even harder to stop. So, so actually I was gonna talk about another thing and then relate this to my original point, but I kind of basically don't really have time for that, so. Oh well. And uh, there we go. So yes, questions, and I'll be here all day, so sorry about that. Yes, Andreas. Did I start five minutes early? I don't. Oh, I thought I was. Uh, no, I think I was moved to ten recently. I was. It's okay, Andreas. You can. I can give it to you personally afterwards. Yes. Yeah. When main net? I don't know. Uh, maybe there's a soft fork this summer. Maybe I don't know. I have no idea. You never know, that's a cursed question. Didn't you see Dan Anderson's talk yesterday? You're not supposed to ask those kind of questions. Those are cursed questions. Okay, yeah, uh, sorry that was kind of all rushed and everything, but yes. Ah, but what are they speculating on? The features, right? Or the properties, the lower fees? A lot of people, you know, altcoins really had a basically nothing market share until Bitcoin fees went up. So a popular view is that the Bitcoin fees inspired people to switch just for people who do the round trips, you know, someone who buys twenty dollars worth of Yeah. Uh, we had Ethereum. I think it's similar though. I think it's a similar story where people noticed something about Bitcoin that made them uncomfortable and then they, they, they sort of left. So with Ethereum they were like, this is like a Turing complete thing or there was like a, a concerns about the, how the scalability debate would be resolved one way or the other. Some people thought this is too easy to change. Some people thought this is too hard to change. So I think it isn't, it's still a, um, I guess I would almost flip the question around and say, why, what else would it explain it? I mean, a lot of people want to make money, right? But so many things don't, um, there are lots of things that don't, that could be scams, but just don't work. So I could try to sell you Monopoly money, and I could say this is all from, for greed or for speculative value, but it doesn't work, right? So you need, somehow you need to like close the loop. I need to convince you to actually buy my Monopoly money. You see what I mean? It's not like, uh, yes, thanks. That's two minutes, right? Thank you. Does that answer your question or no? Okay, good. Yeah, but I have to clarify that I, I think they just won't steal any money in Lightning channels or mainnet or anything. I just that's why I think it's just a yes. What you're saying.
Yes. I think it is, uh, well, I don't know about fundamental, but there are all these assumptions about, you'd have to say, I would say something like, um, you, the amount of money, if you actually, uh, it's like hard to explain quickly, but if we're talking here about this large magnet, I think you're right that it is, but that's why there's a 13,000 block thing instead of just, the way in Bitcoin it works is it's just one block and then you're considered on the track to be valid. But this thing isn't even considered to be valid until after 13,000 blocks. So even though the magnitudes are different, um, that's why one is so difficult, such a difficult trial to try to offset that type of thing. And I do think that there's, at some point it jumps a category where it's not just like the longer the better. At some point it's just so long that you just think like, wow, if something like this is going to happen, it just must be because everyone wants it to happen. And, you know, that kind of... Well, there are a couple things also to say the reorg, if you do the reorg the right way, you can steal a ton of money. And if you're going to reorg on that scale, you steal on that scale for like 13,000 blocks. That's like the amount of Bitcoin to turn over per day. It's, just, it's like a huge amount of money. So uh, it's more than could you, it's, since it's, yeah. Yeah. yes, no, you're right. That's the compartments are a weakness uh, here because you want everyone to be in the same boat. And you do not want some people to be stigmatized. Uh, but one uh, counterpoint to that, though, is that all the side chains should at least be in the same boat. So if you've got one or two popular side chains and one kind of stupid side chain that's like marginally stupid and so sort of like barely not stupid, and it's kind of no one knows what they feel about it, um, you still think that maybe miners would not want to steal from that one because they'd be like, this will just cause uh, theft, this will cause fear in the whole side chain's infrastructure. And, um, Oh, and I had something else I was going to say, but I can't remember what it was. Um, but there's a, you'd want that, you'd want that to blend together, and then you'd want, oh, I had another great point, but I can't remember it, sorry. All right, so I think we're almost out of time, I guess. Yep, okay, so that's the talk. Thank you very much. I'll be here all day. <laughs>